What none knows is when, not if. Now that your life nears its end, when you turn back, what you see is ruin. You think it is a prison. No, it is a vast resonating chamber in which each thing you say or do is new, but the same. What none knows is how to change. Each plateau you reach, if single, limited, only itself, includes traces of all the others. So that in the end, limitation frees you. There is no end if you once see what is there to see. You cannot see what is there to see. Not when she whose love you failed is standing next to you. Then as if refusing the knowledge that life unseparated from her is death. As if again scorning your refusals. She turns away. The end achieved by the unappeased is burial within. Familiar spirit within whose care I grew, within whose disappointment I twist, may we at last see by what necessity the double bind is in the end the figure for human life. By what we love is precluded always by something else we love, as if each no we speak is yes. Each yes, no. The prospect is mixed, but elsewhere the forecast is no better. The eerie where you perch in exhaustion has food and is out of the wind if cold. You feel old, young, old, young. You scan the sea for movement, though the promise of sex or food is the prospect that bewildered you to this end. Something in you believes that is not the end. When you wake, sixth grade will start. The finite you know you fear is infinite, even at 11. What you love is what you should not love, which endless bullies intuit unerringly. The future will be different. You cannot see the end. What none knows is when, not if. Hunger for the absolute. Earth you know is round, but seems flat. You can't trust your senses. You thought you had seen every variety of creature, but not this creature. When I met him, I knew I had weaned myself from God not hunger for the absolute. Oh, unquenched mouth, tonguing what is and must remain inapprehensible, saying, you are not finite. You are not finite. Queer. Lie to yourself about this. 
and you will forever lie about everything. Everybody already knows everything, so you can lie to them. That's what they want. But lie to yourself. What you will lose is yourself. Then you turn into them. For each gay kid whose adolescence was America in the 40s or 50s, the primary, the crucial scenario forever is coming out. Or not, or not, or not, or not, or not. Involuted velleities of self erasure. Quickly after my parents died, I came out. Foundational narrative designed to confer existence. If I had managed to come out to my mother, she would have blamed not me, but herself. The door through which you were shoved out into the light was self-loathing and terror. Thank you, terror. You learned early that adults' genteel fantasies about human life were not, for you, life. You think sex is a knife driven into you to teach you that. Alice and I talked to uh, a group of high school students before the reading tonight. And um, it made me think about the fact that the issues that they face were such crucial issues for me and it took me such a very long time to uh, deal with them. That is, uh, what am I gonna do with my life? What profession am I gonna have? What am I gonna make? What kind of artist can I be? Or should I be an artist at all? Um, anyway, this is a poem that uh, partly uh, broods about um, those things. It's called On This Earth Where No Secure Foothold Is. Wanting to be a movie star like Dean Stockwell or Gigi Perot. Answering an ad at 10 or 11. You made your mother drive you to Hollywood and had expensive Hollywood pictures taken. Hollywood wasn't buying. Everyone is buying, but not everyone wants to buy you. You see the kids watching, brooding. Religion, politics, love, work, sex, each enthrallment, each enthusiasm presenting itself as pleasure or necessity is recruitment. Each kid is at the edge of a sea. At each kid's feet, multitudinous voices say, I will buy you if you buy me. Who do you want to be bought by? The child learns this is the question almost immediately. Mother? Father? Both mother and father tried to enlist you, but soon you learned that you couldn't enlist on both sides at the same time. They lied that you could, but they were at war. And soon you learned you couldn't. How glamorous they were. As they aged, they mourned that to buyers they became invisible. Both of them, in the end, saw beneath them only abyss. You are at the edge of a sea. You want to buy, but you know not everyone wants to buy you. Each enthrallment is recruitment. Your body will be added to the bodies that piled up make the structures of the world. 
your body will be erased, swallowed. Who do you want to be swallowed by? It's almost the same question as to be or not to be. Figuring out, figuring out who they want to be bought by is what all the kids with brooding looks on their face are brooding about. Your weapon is your mind. I have a long poem uh, called Ellen West about an anorexic. Uh, it's spoken by Ellen West and it's based on a great case history by Ludwig Binswanger. And this is a poem about writing that poem. It's always awkward in a poem to have the poem rest on another narrative that the audience doesn't know, but there's no alternative. It takes 20 minutes to read Ellen West, so I can't do that. Writing Ellen West. Writing Ellen West was exorcism. Exorcism of that thing within Frank that wandered after his mother's death to die. Inside him was that thing that he must expel from him to live. He read the case of Ellen West as a senior in college and immediately wanted to write a poem about it, but couldn't. So he stored it as he has stored so much that awaits existence. Unlike Ellen, he was never anorexic, but like Ellen, he was obsessed with eating and the arbitrariness of gender and having to have a body. Ellen lived out the war between the mind and the body, lived out in her body each stage of the war, its journey and progress in which compromise Reconciliation is attempted, then rejected, then mourned, till she reaches at last in an ecstasy, costing not less than everything, death. He was grateful he was not impelled to live out the war in his body, hiding in compromise, well wadded with art he adored, and with stupidity and distraction. The particularity inherent in almost all narrative, though contingent and exhausting, tells the story of the encounter with the particularity that flesh as flesh must make. Ellen West was written in the year after his mother's death. By the time she died, he had so thoroughly betrayed the ground of intimacy on which his life was founded. He had no right to live. No use for him to tell himself that he shouldn't feel this because he felt this. He didn't think this, but he thought this. After she died, his body wanted to die, but his brain, his cunning, didn't. He likes narratives with plots that feel as if no one wills them. His mother in her last years revealed that she wanted him to move back to Bakersfield and teach at Bakersfield College and live down the block. He thought his mother, without knowing that this is what she wanted, wanted him to die. All he had told her in words and more than words for years was that her possessiveness and terror at his independence were wrong, wrong, wrong. He was the only person she wanted to be with, but he refused to live down the block. And then she died. It must be lifted from the mind must be lifted and placed elsewhere, must not remain in the mind alone. Out of the thousand myriad voices, thousand myriad stories in each human head, when his mother not died, 
there was Ellen West. This is the body that you can draw out of you to expel from you the desire to die. Give it a voice. Give each scene of her life a particularity and necessity that in Binswanger's recital are absent. Enter her skin so that you can then make her other and expel her. Survive her. Animal mind, eating the ground of Western thought, the mind-body problem. She, who in the last months of her life abandoned writing poems in disgust at the failure of her poems, is a poem. She in death is incarnated on a journey whose voice is the voice of her journey. Arrogance of Plutarch, of Shakespeare and Berlioz, who thought they made what Cleopatra herself could not make. Arrogance of the maker. Verda killed himself, and then young men all over Europe imitated him and killed themselves, but his author, Goethe, cunning master of praxis, lived. Frank thought when anything is made, it is made not by its likeness, not by its twin or mirror, but its opposite. Ellen, in his poem, asks, Without a body, who can know himself at all? In your pajamas, you move down the stairs, just to the point where the adults couldn't yet see you. To hear more clearly the din, the sweet cacophony of adults partying. Phonograph voices, among them, Photograph voices, their magpie beauty. Sweet din, magpie beauty. One more poem, one more book in which you figure out how to make something out of not knowing itself. Enough, I'm sorry, out of not knowing enough. Name the bed. Half light, just after dawn. As you turn back in the doorway, you to whom the ordinary sensuous world seldom speaks, expected to see in the thrown off, rumpled bedclothes, nothing. Scream stretched across it. Someone wanted more from that bed than was found there. Name the bed that's not true of. Bed where your twin died. Eraser bed. Mouth. Mouth. It was as if starving, his stomach rebelled at food. As quickly as he ate, it passed right through him. His body refused what his body needed. Recipe for death. But he said, what others think is food isn't food. It passed right through him. He shoved meat into his mouth, but still his body retained nothing, absorbed nothing. He grows thinner. He thinks he cannot live on nothing. He has the persistent sense that whatever object he seeks is not what he seeks. Now he repeats the litany of his choices. Love which always to his surprise exhilarated even as it tormented and absorbed him, unendingly under everything, art. 
trying to make a work of art he can continue to inhabit. The choices he made, he said he made almost without choosing. The best times, I must confess, are when one cannot help oneself. Has his pride at his intricate inventions come to nothing? Nothing he now can name or touch is food. Sex was the bed where you learned to be naked and not naked at the same time. Bed where you learned to move the unsustainable weight inside. Then too often lost the key to it. Faces too close that despite themselves promise, then out of panic, disappoint. Not just out of panic, only in his mind is he freely both here and not here. The imperious or imagined needs of those you love or think you love demand you forget that when you smell your flesh, you smell unfulfillment. We are creatures, he thinks, caught in an obscure, ruthless economy. His hunger grows as whatever his mouth fastens upon fails to feed him. Recipe for death. But he's sure he'll learn something once he sees La Notte again. He's placed Duino allergies next to his bed. He craves the cold catechism Joyce mastered writing Ithaca. Now he twists within the box he cannot exit or rise above. He thinks he must die when what will not allow him to retain food makes him see his body has disappeared. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is a poem about uh, the guilt of the survivor. Uh, the great uh, crisis of my generation was the AIDS epidemic. And um, so many people one knew uh, and cared for uh, died uh, without uh, seemingly... Uh, uh, necessity. Um, one had no idea why one survived and uh, one's friends did not. Brilliant people like James Merrill did not. Well, this is called for the AIDS dead. The plague you have thus far survived. They didn't. Nothing that they did in bed that you didn't. Writing a poem, I cleave to you. You means I, one, you, as well as the you inside you constantly talk to. Without justice or logic, without sense, you survived. They didn't. Nothing that they did in bed that you didn't. Of his bones are coral made. He still trolled books, films, gossip, his own past, searching not just for ideas that dissect the mountain, that in his early old age, he is almost convinced cannot be dissected. He searches for stories, stories the pattern of whose not dimly traces the pattern of his own, what is intolerable in the world, which is to say intolerable in himself, ingested, digested, so the stories that haunt each of us, for each of us, rip open the mountain. The creature smothered in death clothes, 
dragging into the forest bodies he killed to make meaning. The woman who found that she, to her bewilderment and horror, had a body. As if certain algae that keep islands of skeletons alive, that make living rock from trash, from carcasses left behind by others, as if algae were to produce out of themselves and what they most fear, the detritus over whose kingdom they preside. The burning fountain is the imagination within us that ingests and by its devouring generates, generates what is most antithetical to itself. It returns the intolerable as brilliant dream, visible, opaque, teasing analysis, makes from what you find hardest to swallow, most indigestible, your food. And now, um, in, in August of this year, I'm going to publish a, a collected poems. And uh, it's going to have a section of new poems at the end. And I want to read uh, three poems from that. Old and young. If you looked at someone in a mirror, looking at you in a mirror, your eyes meeting there, not face to face, backstage as you prepare for a performance. You look into the long horizontal mirror that backs the long theatrical makeup table that runs along one wall of the high dressing room eerie from which you must descend to the stage. There in the mirror, you see his eyes looking into your eyes in the mirror, where you, plural, amused, begin to talk. Suddenly inspired not to look at each other directly, but held by this third thing, as his eyes allow your eyes to follow his eyes in the mirror. You ask if anyone has ever made a movie in which two people talk not directly to each other, but during the entire static but dynamic film, as they go about their lives, their eyes are locked staring at each other in a mirror, that they together hold a few feet above them or beside them, knowing if they look away, they will lose what they now possess, trapped but freed, neither knowing why this is better, why this, so long as no one enters, is release. Because you are twice his age, this is the place in nature we can meet. Space which other every other space merely approximates you ask again if anybody made a movie about this. Others enter loudly, and when you, plural, each look away, you, plural, soon go on. Next to last poem, Half Light. That crazy drunken night, I maneuvered you out into a field outside of Coachella. I'd never seen a sky so full of stars, as if the dirt of our lives still were sprinkled with glistening white shells from the ancient seabed beneath us. They receded long ago. Parallel. We lay in parallel furrows that suffocated fearful look on your face Jim yesterday I heard your wife on the phone tell me you died almost nine months ago Jim now we cannot ever bitter that we cannot ever 
have the conversation that in nature and alive we never had. Now, not ever. We have not spoken in years. I thought perhaps at 90 or 100, two broken down old men, we wouldn't give a damn and find speech. When I tell you that all the years we were undergraduates, I was madly in love with you. You say you knew. I say I knew you knew. You say there was no place in nature we could meet. You say this as if you need me to admit something. No place in nature given our natures. Or is this warning? I say what is happening now is happening only because one of us is dead. You laugh and say, or both of us. Our words will be weirdly jolly. That light I now envy exists only on this page. And um, the last poem in this section of new poems uh, is called Visions at 74. And it's the last poem I'll read. Visions at 74. The planet turns there without you. Beautiful. Exiled by death, you cannot touch it. Weird joy to watch postulates lived out and discarded, something crowded inside us always craving to become something glistening outside us. The relentless planet showing itself the logic of what is buried inside it. To love existence is to love what is indifferent to you, you think, as you watch it turn there, beautiful. A world that can know itself only by world. Soon it must colonize and infect the stars. You are an hypothesis made of flesh. What you will teach the stars is constant rage at the constant prospect of not being. Sometimes when I wake, it's because I hear a knock, 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 two knocks, quite clear. I wake and listen. It's nothing. Thanks.